All right, so that was patent absurdity. Again, just kind of highlighting, you know, the issues with patent, uh, software patent. You know, you have the, the example where the, the guy patented the kiosk and then someone bought that patent and interpreted it broadly and made claims based upon that, that it could, you know, basically own and control all of e-commerce, um, which they did do. Uh, you know, so, I mean, there's a lot of things like you would never think are patentable. Like uh, one of my homies' uh, uncles patented the strip mall. The concept of a strip mall, you know, like they probably made billions of dollars off of just Florida alone. Um, but it's interesting. Yeah, patents, definitely an interesting thing. Um, and we're going to move on to licensing. All right, here we are, you know, Cine 230. We're getting into licensing here, all right? Um, listen, if you want to do a remix legally, and not legally using fair use, but I mean an authorized remix, right, of any sort, you will need a license. Licensing is the fulcrum of the industry. It's of the industry, meaning every industry out there relies on licensing contracts, essentially. That's what a license is. So we're going to go over this. This is, again, like I said, mind-blowing shit. You know, you'll never be the same after this, but, you know, it is very practical information. And like almost every industry that you're going to go into, uh, you're going to have to deal with this. You may not specifically have to deal with licensing yourself, but if you go into any creative industry, if you go in into any uh, in innovative industry, if you go work at Nike, if you go work at uh, a, you know, a drug company, etc., you're going to deal with these things, the li licensing, copyright, trademark, patent. These things are, again, are just so vital to creativity and innovation, uh, specifically in the United States, that you need to know a little bit about this stuff. Okay, so this is some World Intellectual Property Organization data to give you some, uh, you know, bits. You just, just, these are just some bits for you, some knowledge, some info. Okay, no need to uh, study for this stuff, you know, but. Um, United States, the estimated value of the United States collective intellectual property catalog is about five to five and a half trillion dollars. Okay, it makes up a major part of the American economy and a major part of the American GDP, which is the well, that is the the economy, and it's one of our greatest exports. Okay. Uh, it creates a lot of money every year, <laughs> uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in actual revenue. So value means worth, revenue means actual money being brought in. This is estimated that's you know, upwards of 200 billion. It could be 10 times that. You know, it just kind of really depends on how that is fleshed out in the mathematics. But you could see that this is far more than it was in the 1970s, where it was a couple billion dollars, uh, you know, 27 billion in 1990. I mean, it's just important. I mean, and that, that's more than inflation, right? Because we're an information economy here. Okay, uh, 45 to 60% of our exports are intellectual properties, okay? And 35 to 40% of our economy is made up of intellectual properties, okay? Lots of money is invested into research and development, but the thing is with R&D is that oftentimes there's no return on the research and development. As you invest, you know, a million dollars into this new patented idea or trying to patent an idea or come up with something, and it just flounders. It doesn't work out right. You can't get the patent on it. You get the patent on it. You can't figure out a way to economically, you know, create, create the product and or the patented idea and the technology or whatever it is. Okay. Uh, last year in 2019, 665,000 patents were filed for in the United States and actually 50% of them were granted. Um, that's a lot. 665,000 patents were filed for. So 330 or so thousand patents were filed in the U.S. last year. Um, half of that amount, so like 150,000 of those patents, were 
uh, filed by non-U.S. residents. And again, a lot of these from um, multi you know, inventors on behalf of multinational uh, corporations, many Asian companies, uh, Japanese companies, etc. Okay, um, and yo, just like straight up and down, you know, 30% of um, U.S. jobs relate to intellectual properties. That could be more. Uh, it's hard to really, it's hard to really say, but a lot of jobs are really tied to this stuff. Um, but it could, it could be more. You know, you work at a record store and you sell records. You're selling intellectual properties. At the end of the day, music commodities containing intellectual properties. You work at a video rental store. Well, I guess those don't exist anymore. But you, you're, you're peddling intellectual properties. You work at the duck store. You work at a bookstore. Um, you know, I don't know if they factor those in, but if you work at a video game publishing company, if you work at a pharmaceutical company, if you work at a technology company, if you work at a university, hmm, is your job related to intellectual property? Um, so here's just an interesting way to kind of think of it. Think of a Blu-ray. Well, the name Blu-ray is trademarked. Um, uh, which, you know, whatever, you probably, you probably know that. Um, but the technology itself, the, the, the format itself, the Blu-ray format is a patent, and it belongs to a patent pool or a cross-licensing agreement between a bunch of companies, Panasonic, Sony, Samsung, Hitachi, Sharp, Dell, etc. Uh, not Disney, <laughs> not Toshiba. And basically this, the Blu-ray is, uh, is owned by, um, you know, the technology is owned by One Blue, which is a patent pool. So all these major technology manufacturers had different patented ideas that would work for Blu-ray technology. So instead of, um, you know, license, one company licensing from all the others or, or suing one another or making competing products, they decided to form a licensing pool which would basically mean this. Anybody who wants to make a Blu-ray who's not part of the pool, right, Disney, has to license <coughs> from one Blue to uh, make its movies on a Blu-ray disc, okay? Um, so that's what a cross-licensing agreement is. <coughs> but like, yeah, when you watch a Blu-ray, like the machine, the Blu-ray player is likely has a bunch of patents in it. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, encoding process, how you burn a Blu-ray is patented, uh, how you play it back, how it's decoded uh, is, is patented, the compression formats used are pa patented. So all this patents go into Blu-ray, that's why it's like 25 bucks, um, you know, but, but anyways, um, that's what a, 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 you know, a patent pool is or a cross-licensing agreement. The other example we had was the Edison Trust uh, that we saw in the Drunk History um, you know, where they were essentially a cartel. Uh, here's another example, is the Civil War, is a trademark that's owned by the University of Oregon and the Oregon State uh, University. I believe the trademark's actually filed for, on, uh, by the State of Oregon uh, Board of Education, I, be I believe. But, you know, um, neither the Ducks or the Beavers own the right to use Civil War. But in the product, this product market, sports, entertainment, um, you know, sports entertainment, clothing, stuff like that related, uh, you can't just make Civil War gear. So if like uh, there's a big Civil War game, let's say the Beavers are actually good again and it's a big, big deal, you can't just make a t-shirt, you know, that says something, 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 Civil War on it. Uh, because you'd be infringing on the trademark of both those universities. Um, both those universities, you know, own that, it re represents a similar, you know, cross-licensing agreement or, or, or um, you know, a pool, licensing pool, or a, whatever you want to call it. 